Do we even begin to understand the beginning of Christianity? Every sin in the history of the world will either be punished in hell or pardoned in Christ and therefore punished in Christ. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are the very righteousness of God because we are in Christ. Hello listeners, before you start this episode, I just wanted to give you a quick warning that the topic of discussion for today is not for little years. We're going to be discussing grown-up topics that are very serious, not in an inappropriate way, but just in a way that I wanted to warn you about ahead of time. The following clip is by Paul Washer in his sermon on 1 Thessalonians 4.3 entitled, Sexual Immorality, Part 1. Any pagan walking across, trespassing your heart, any pagan thought, any pagan idea, can have no mercy. Kill it! Grind it to powder! Drive a stake straight through its heart! Tolerate it. Be severe with yourself. Deal with it. So many times these types of things are taught. And everyone just gets together and hugs one another and sings Kumbaya. That is not what needs to be done here. You need to know this is terrible. And you need to fight it. With everything you've got. Hello and welcome to Afterthought, a podcast in conjunction with the Biblical Beginnings blog. I'm your host, Lauren Herford, and today I'm joined by a longtime family friend who is going to be remaining anonymous due to the sensitivity of the subject. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're actually going to be talking about the subject of pornography and the growing ability to get pornography. It's free access pretty much online, and there's a lot of people who are struggling with this, and so... The reason why I brought you on is because you and your husband have actually been dealing with this for how many years? Oh, well, we've been married for 10 years this month. And it was wow, actually, congratulations. Thank you. It's a lot of hard work, as you <laughs> know. <laughs> yeah. So he's actually struggled with this ever since he was a child. And, you know, just being exposed to it at an early age, it, you know, it, it sticks with you through adulthood if you don't take care of it right away or if you don't have somebody to steer you in the right direction or educate you on how dangerous uh, pornography is and how damaging it is to relationships, uh, especially if you're married. Yeah, it's really interesting to me the fact that so many people actually got introduced to this as a child. One thing that happened to me whenever I was really young, I don't even remember how old I was. I must have been about 10 or 11 maybe, maybe nine. I was young enough not to understand what was happening, but I went and stayed the night with a friend actually, and she was a really, really sweet girl, and she had a little sister, and they were just the sweetest. Like, you would never assume that anything like this would happen. And they lived with their grandparents. And really late at night, when we had just gotten done giggling and being silly little girls, she said, okay, it's almost 12.30 you have to see this really weird show that comes on the TV at 12.30. And it was porn. And I was, I just wanted to run away. It was just really uncomfortable for me. I didn't know what to do because it was like these two little girls and they were giggling like this was funny. But apparently this was something that they did all the time around 12.30. And these are just two little girls that don't actually understand what they're seeing. So it's really interesting to me that there is so, so much of it available now. But at that time... I mean, they're really, we didn't have a computer in the house. It must be a lot worse now for kiddos who are left unsupervised with any type of access to television or internet computers and stuff like that. So this happened to him as a kid too. And he grows up, obviously, as a young man. That's very enticing. But nobody at that point is talking about how damaging this is. Not that I'm aware of, at least. I know right now you can go online and look at half a dozen TED Talks on how damaging this is to the brain and how damaging it is to how men look at women. But what they're not talking about, what you won't hear in a secular sense, is how damaging it is to your walk with Christ and how damaging it is to your marriage. So usually whenever um, I have someone on, 
on. I usually like to start with their testimony. So let's start there if you want to give a quick rundown of how you got saved and how that changed the dynamic of this issue in your marriage. Well, when I was first invited to church, I was 13. You know, of course, I was like, okay, you know, I don't want to go to hell. So uh, let me get saved. And, uh, and then afterwards, you know, the baptism of that, um, I was going to a Baptist church at the time. So from 13 to about 20, I was just kind of in and out of church, not really understanding the full extent of the gospel and what true repentance means um, and to be free from sin. Until I was about 20, that's when I really decided that uh, I was going to follow Christ. But even then, I was still going to a particular church that was more of a charismatic Pentecostal church um, mm -hmm. in Dallas. So there was a lot of emotionalism at that church and sensationalism. So, you know, I still kind of felt like I had a pretty good relationship with God. But, and then my husband, he, uh, he didn't get saved quote unquote, saved until he was about 19. And even <laughs> then, you know, he was with me going to this charismatic church and we were there for several years. So that's all we knew. It's just that Pentecostal realm. And then he came across John MacArthur, John Piper. Oh, I didn't know that. So it was him that came across that first? Yes. Yes. Oh, he okay. Did. That's he cool. Because you sent across. it to me. Yeah. yeah. He, oh, that's cool. He, he came across it first, uh, that strange fire conference. Yeah. And I forget exactly how he came about those videos and how he came about finding uh, John MacArthur, but I believe he was in Austin okay. and he got a hold of one of his books and it was life changing for my husband. So he shared this with me and it was just mind blowing and I was just like wow this makes a lot more sense and it right. kind of explains why I've been on this emotional roller coaster mm -hmm. my entire walk with Christ yeah. and uh, so you know after listening and reading some books of John MacArthur and there's one book in particular Charismatic Chaos from John MacArthur, that really just kind of opened up my eyes to a lot of things that were going on and just kind of explained some strange things that we uh, kind of felt uncomfortable with um, right. that was happening in the church we were attending. You know, we couldn't explain it. We just kind of right. felt like this wasn't right, you know. The word of faith is so, it's so everywhere that it's almost like hard to know that there's even another option. Right. I think that's what blew me away so much when you sent that Strange Fire conference to me is that I had already walked away from from the very idea of Word of Faith just through you know various things that I had heard Paul Washer say in some of his sermons. But I didn't know anything about any of it still. I had only been saved for like a year when you sent me that. And I was in Oklahoma at the time. And I remember I was, I don't know if I was like wrapping Christmas presents or what it was, but mm -hmm. I was sitting on the floor and all of this stuff is around me and it's all crafty stuff. So it must have been wrapping gifts or, or a birthday or something. And, and I'm just, I'm glued to my phone watching this, this strange fire conference question and answers. Yeah. And I had completely forgotten that I was supposed to be doing anything. <laughs> I know it was very intriguing video. It is. I had never heard anything about it. Yeah. So it was just, it was a huge blessing for me. And well, you know, in a way I uh, was kind of angry at first right with uh, just because it kind of felt like everything had been a lie you know all that I had known all I knew up until that point when it just felt like a big lie yeah and so I was even questioning my salvation you know I was questioning my faith yeah and so I was kind of down for a few months and then of course I just kind of have to like okay well let's start over let's you know learn what the gospel is really about and yeah. what it really means to be a follower of Christ yeah. so I'm definitely still learning there, there's a lot of things that need to be undone, it feels mm -hmm. like, yeah. since it was like almost 15 years that I have been right. involved in this Word of Faith type church. Yeah, and not in a little way either. It's not like when we say involved, because I had the same issue, like not that we went to church on Sunday mornings, but just like 
any time there was anything to do with the church that we were we were involved in. Even whenever you and I weren't going to the same church later on in life, because we met when we were teenagers, later on in life, when we were going to different churches and stuff, I can still testify to the fact that it was like whatever they were doing, anytime it was open, whatever, you know, if we needed to drive a certain distance, that didn't matter. Because for me personally, I know I, I knew I wasn't saved whenever I was confronted with this truth because I was doing all of that to earn my spot in heaven. So yeah. it was like, it wasn't just a little bit of involvement. It was completely immersing our entire lives into right. this. Yeah. So yeah. It's really cool that God was already working that discernment in your heart about these things that were obviously not biblical, but just it's hard to know whenever that's all you've ever known that that's not biblical. Yeah, so it was, it was really big. It felt like a big just kick to the gut. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever, yep. uh, you know, we uh, found out, which, you know, it's, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Yeah, I think a lot of people who leave cult-like groups feel that way. They feel this sort of, almost like you're going through the motions of grief. Like, first comes <laughs> denial, and then comes anger, <laughs> and then comes Bye. acceptance. Yeah, because it was, I, I mean, most of the churches that we were in were very... They were very cult-like. The pastors were giving prophetic words. You needed to listen to prophetic words when they were given to you. You were expected to do all the things that you were told. You were expected not to question anything that you were told. So it was very cult-like in the fact that you just were told to trust what you were being given was the Word of God. So whenever you come out of that and you look at all the people who you loved and you trusted and you respected and you're like, wait a minute, did you guys know? That you were teaching me things that were unbiblical and you just taught me them anyways? Or are you also deceived what's happening here? And it can be really devastating to just to consider the time, for me personally, the time I wasted not giving God the glory and worshiping for me a false, what was a false idol, a false version of Christ was really hard to accept that how many people knew, like how many people could look at my life and see that there was no fruit and they just didn't want to tell me because I was pretty... <laughs> I was pretty confrontational. I'm sure I wouldn't have been very happy about hearing it, but like it really, it, it does motivate me though more so to go and, and help other people out of the out of that movement because it is hard to leave it. It's hard to accept it, and it's hard to understand. I did like like you were saying. I love that you said that you had to start from scratch because I had to pick up the Bible and try to understand what part of what I know about God is accurate. And what part isn't? Because I don't want to literally scratch everything and right. leave off something that's true and say, well, that can't be true because Joyce Meyer said it one time, you know, <laughs> so yeah. it was this massive process that even still today, sometimes somebody will say something or I'll get sick or something and I'll think, gosh, I better not tell anyone that I'm sick. And then I'll remember, wait, no, that's not accurate. That's not biblical. I can tell people if I'm sick. <laughs> it won't change anything. I'm not speaking anything into existence. So it stays right. with you so yeah. long. Hopefully it doesn't take 15 years for that to stop. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's a shorter. <laughs> yeah. But I don't right? know. So you guys got a hold of John MacArthur. And so did you at that point, did y'all have to leave that church? We did not. We started questioning whether or not, deciding whether or not we should move on to a different church. And my husband ended up taking a job and we knew that we wanted to find a different type of church. So we tried a few different ones. And the one that we liked the best was actually a, a Presbyterian church. It, yeah. it was, you know, leaned more towards what we felt like was biblical and biblically accurate. We didn't, we weren't there for very long because we ended up moving okay. back. Yeah. And he's at all this time, while this is happening, is he struggling and you don't know yet that he's struggling with this? At this point, I did not know uh, the severity of it. And I'm not sure exactly, uh, you know, if he was looking at anything while I was, wasn't was there. You know, he was working nights and I was subbing and the kids were at school. So sometimes he would go without looking at anything or doing anything, you know, a few months and then he would get back into it just, you know, on yeah. and off. And that's what I kind of thought the whole time that it was a struggle, kind of like that. But, right. uh, and most of the time I could kind of tell if something was off. Um, and yeah. I'd ask him about it, and then he'd kind of, he'd confess to what he had done or 
you know, what was happening. But yeah, at this point, I didn't know the severity and what yeah. all he had done prior to me finding right. out the whole story. Let me kind of backtrack. Um, I knew about this before we even got married. Uh, right. While we were dating, I knew that he had looked at pornography and we've even actually looked at it together while we were dating. Right. You know, at that time we weren't like truly saved. And yeah. so we just kind of thought that's, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we were involved in premarital sex also. And so that's kind of what led to viewing this right. pornography. Uh, it only happened a couple of times, you know, cause I was just kind of like, you know, we knew that it wasn't right. We, it just didn't feel right at all. Yeah, um, but that's just kind of what the world tells you and the culture that you know oh, it's okay. Everybody does it. Yeah, yeah, everybody does it. It's okay to have a little fun or experiment with this and that. But right, you know, we were eighteen, nineteen years old at that time, um, <laughs> and so we were still kids. We were with no clueless. biblical discipleship whatsoever. Right, like there, there's yeah. no teaching about this in the in the circles that we were running. You don't oh. hear about it. It's not addressed. Mm -hmm. It's most of the time the leaders are involved in just as much promiscuity as the younger people or the adults are having affairs, and it's just sort of being brushed under the rugs. And so it's really not. It's not never addressed. I don't remember ever hearing about this um, Me either. Yeah. in any of those churches, yeah, which is a shame because if you can catch it early, if you can just stop it from happening altogether in your home, it gives your children a better chance of avoiding it as adults. Definitely. So, you know, I, I knew about this uh, and it was actually even something that made me hesitate to even marry my husband. But yeah. You know, like a lot of people, a lot of couples, we thought that, well, when whenever we get married, this won't be such a problem or right. the pornography will go away because we'll be married. And unfortunately, that is not the case at right. all whatsoever. Yeah. And a lot of people, even at first, I didn't want to consider it this, but it's an addiction. It's a sexual mm -hmm. addiction. And so right. getting married isn't going to fix the problem of viewing pornography um, right yeah because it's lighting up a completely different portion of the brain so it's not right. it's not really about the sensation of being physical with a person it's a different thing to see something or imagine something that's completely different than physically involving yourself with something so and I think that that's one of those distinctions that that really people miss and why it's an addiction because it releases dopamines into the brain. Another way of getting dopamines is doing methamphetamines. So just to give yeah. any of the listeners an idea of how dangerous that can be. And that's that's one of the dangers of just blowing this off like it's no mm -hmm. big deal. Yes. Because your brain wants more and more and more and more and more. And statistics show that so many of the inmates in prisons right now will link back to an addiction to pornography for why they are now in prison because they started off with pornography and maybe even just like not even pornography maybe just a sex scene in a show and that led to more and that led to more and, and that need for the dopamine increased and increased until they felt the need to go and act on their desires to a point where they break the law and end up in jail so it's very addictive for sure yes. so i guess uh you know just kind of being uneducated about it uh, at a young age, you know, when we got married, both of us really, you know, we kind of pushed it to the side also, I guess, you know, we never really took it seriously. And I just, I guess I was just absolutely clueless to what he was dealing with. And because he, he never really opened up about it to me. And, uh, you know, as the years went on, I guess it was just easier for him to keep quiet about it and not tell me. You know, and every now and again, I would find out from uh, like a Google search history. I just, you know, and I remember those times just like they were yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, it was just devastating. And, yeah. you know, I'd be upset for a couple of weeks um, and then... I just, I guess I would get over it and move on and, and then we'd be okay. And it seems like he would go a few months, maybe six months, um, and then I'd find something again. But uh, Will you touch on that real quick just before we move on for the listeners? Because I know that there's going to be a lot of women who listen to this. Actually, statistically, 56% of divorces link 
their divorce to this. And I have family members who have been divorced recently over this very issue. 47% of families admit to this being a problem in their home. So this is something that probably 50% of the women listening to this have either had to deal with with their spouses or have had to deal with with their teenage sons. So will you give a little bit of information, if you're comfortable with this, about the depressive state that this sent you into? Because I know for a long time, it wasn't just that this was was upsetting to you, but that this was really a point of, do I even want to live like this? Do I want to continue to have to deal with this? So will you touch on that a little bit just for the women who are maybe in a similar state as you were in? So when he told me, when he finally opened up to me uh, back in February, you know, it just, it literally just felt like my whole world had shattered. We have three children right now. We have a eight and a half year old daughter. We have a seven year old son and a eight and a half month old son. So, you know, we're a pretty close family. Uh, we do a lot of things together. So, you know, I just had this picture perfect family in my head. Right. And he's a very respectable man. You know, he's super sweet. Yeah. He's a great father. He works. He's a very really likable hard. person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So just, it just shattered my world, broke my heart. I was just devastated. And it just, felt like my heart was just ripped to shreds with, uh, and there's just anger, disappointment, betrayal, mostly, mostly, most of all, most of all, it just felt like, how could he do this to me? How could he lie to me like this? I hit the trust was broken and still to this day, uh, you know, I'm trying to work on my trust issues. So, you know, I was fearful that he was constantly looking at other women, even if I was yeah. with him. But the feeling of betrayal brought me down most of all. So when you're going through this, because I had actually read a blog where a woman whose husband had been struggling with this and eventually actually had an affair, which just for the listeners who, who might think this is no big deal, um, pornography increases the chances of marital infidelity by 300 percent so it's it's very serious this is not a light issue to take on the surface like let's set aside the spiritual side of this for just a moment on the surface if we want our believing marriages to succeed our christian brothers and sisters to succeed in marriage this is something we all need to take very seriously so I was reading this particular post, this article from this woman who um, was told by a Christian counselor not to talk to anyone about this, because if she did, she would feel ashamed, which is horrible advice. That's just yeah. the worst advice I have ever heard. Thankfully, she also felt like that was horrible advice and got out of that counselor's office and found some um, some support groups. So has it helped you to sort of open up about this and talk to people about this? Is there something that you would recommend for women who are right there in that same situation? Yes. This, this time around, you know, the other times that I found out, I was able to kind of pick myself back up and you know, brush myself off and keep going. But this time around, it was just so, I don't know, just so um, heart crushing and devastating. Um, I couldn't do it on my own. I just couldn't. So I um, opened up to somebody that I trust. And, uh, you know, at first, just I wanted to keep it on a low key. It's, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, as wives, we don't want people to look at our husbands in a bad light, especially if they're well-known or respected men. So, of course, I didn't go off and, and tell everybody I knew. Right. Um, you know, it's very, very touchy, private subject. So I just talked to somebody that I trusted, and it was my pastor's wife. Yeah, um, that's a good and, option. Yeah. And so she was able to refer me to some good resources. And then uh, later on, I told just a couple more people who were very close to me and you were one of them and people that I trusted, you know, not to, you know, go tell our business or right. who wouldn't be judgmental or look at us differently. Um, yeah, that's it. 
You know, that's a really frustrating thing in the church. First of all, the statistics just show that most of the people that would be judgmental of that are probably struggling with it themselves. Over 50% of pastors will report that they watch pornography on a regular basis. 68% of church-going men admit to it. Young people between 18 and 24, those numbers increased to 76%. That's massive. That's a big thing. So anybody who's saying to themselves, this person is struggling with this issue and, you know, I just don't even want to hear about it or help, you're going to really end up alienating 75% of the young adults to college student age in your church. This is something that we need to be addressing with love and with grace and with mercy because we are not different from one another just because we have different pet sins. In fact, gossip, which is definitely something that more women deal with than men, is listed within the same list as adultery and homosexuality. So lest anyone listening should think, well, I'm so superior, we're not. We're not superior. And it's really sad to me that there isn't a push for loving and caring for the wives in particular. There's a lot of movements to help the husbands. And I think that's great. And there should be more of that. But we really need to be able to have some kind of support for the wives having to deal with this. Yes, especially, you know, the men, from what I've learned from this experience, um, you know, or your husband, men are usually pretty secretive anyway. And they can't do this on their own. That was a big mistake that uh, my husband thought for a long time, that he could do this on his own. And uh, that's another reason why he never opened up to me about it. But if, and I learned that if we as wives, if we're not quick to um, bash him or uh, belittle him about this problem, which is very easy to do in, in the moment when you're grieving and you're hurt. Yeah. What helped me was after reading a book, called When His Secret Sin Breaks Your Heart by Kathy Gallagher. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but um, they have a Pure Life Ministries, and they address in this book that um, we have to shift the focus off of ourselves and off of our hurt and pain and shift it to our husband's spiritual welfare, you know, because this, this is a spiritual battle. So if we're strong enough, which we can't be on our own, but with yeah. the Holy Spirit's help, if we are able to shift the focus off of ourselves and remember that our husband is also a human being, also a sinner, also has a soul. And fortunately, and with my husband, um, he was willing to put up boundaries. Um, right. And because uh, some I've heard or read some stories where the husband isn't willing to stop viewing pornography or masturbating. Uh, so, you know, that's which is that's, probably where the divorce, the high divorce rate. Is right. Coming. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, he he was very sorrowful within the sin that he was involved in the sexual sin. So that was another reason why he he wanted to uh, put it into this and for us to figure out the game plan but yeah um, which is the difference between the false convert and the genuinely saved sinner not that um sin is something that isn't still going to be there but that as a believer you hate that sin and you want to do everything that you can to mortify that sin so the, the men that would say i'm going to just keep doing what i want to do that's definitely a big sign of false con conversion if you can still look at the sin that supposedly crucified your savior um he's probably not your savior if you can view it in a positive light so definitely that's a good point to point out that your husband has genuinely been sorrowful genuine repentance a god given of repentance that's a big that's a big thing to consider and i love what you're saying about the wives which i really just want to point out that you're not saying oh this is so easy just right, no, you know just just set it aside and think about your husband um but what you're saying is that this is this is difficult but good advice right right yes yeah, yeah it's definitely I have to make a conscious decision every single day not to be bitter, not to 
have resentment still, um, not to be hurt, not to carry this this weight of anger towards him. I have to remember that he's my best friend. I love him, and uh, I want I want to help him uh, with his spiritual well being, and that's what we're called as wives also to be helpers. The scripture which I should probably know this by now and have it memorized better. But the scripture that talks about carrying one another's burdens. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a burden on a husband. Even You know what? And, and then, you know, we keep saying, or I keep saying husband, husband. It could even be women that are right. dealing with this uh, sexual sin of pornography and masturbation. Yeah, eighty six percent of women when yeah. when old have said that they have viewed it. There's not a lot of statistics on whether or not they're addicted to it because there's all the statistics focus on men, but it does say that at least eighty six percent of women in the church that were polled have said that they have seen it in the past. At that verse, the scripture that you were referring to is Galatians six. And so it's, um, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard for another. For each one will bear his own load. So that's Galatians 6 verses 1 through 5. And another thing, um, another scripture that I would point to is that in the very beginning, whenever God made Adam, it was God who proclaimed it's not good for man to be alone, that man needs a help meet, he needs a helper. And that's why the wives are there. And likewise, like you were mentioning, if there are wives struggling with this, that the husband can be spiritually discerning and leading her in the same way as what we're talking about here. Although I'm sure the dynamics of that might be a little bit different, just in the fact that for, for a woman in particular, there's not a lot of spotlight on it. So it might be a little bit of a different dynamic. Well, what was the book that um, that you said helped him so much? So uh, the Peer Life Ministries, it's uh, ran by a husband and wife. Husband's name is Steve Gallagher, and that wife's name is Kathy. And for the men, they have a book called At the Altar of Sexual Idolatry. So after I had ordered my book and I had read it, I ordered my husband this other book by Steve, who also struggled, well actually not struggled, but he was engulfed in um, pornography, mm-hmm. prostitute, like visiting prostitutions or like oh. a massage parlors that had prostitution in there. Oh, I uh, thought that was a joke. I didn't know those really existed. Yeah, I know. You'd be surprised. <laughs> You'd be surprised. It seems like a lot of people are so clueless about the sexual sin and um, what really goes on. And like you were saying earlier, um, you know, it starts off with a sex scene in a movie, but then, you know, there's they're wanting more and more and more and more. So that's kind of what happened with Mr. Gulliver here. Um, You know, it started off as something which, you know, what the world would call innocent by just looking at a woman uh, walking around in the store or down the street. Uh, But, you know, one thing leads to another. And I know this is kind of random but you know a lot of growing up i heard the phrase you can look but not touch right yes yeah. definitely so that's Everywhere. a huge lie <laughs> yes it is <laughs> that's a huge Percent. lie um because in matthew 5 27 through 28 you know whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart so to just look at somebody whether you know it's a man or a woman whether it's the husband or the wife jesus holds us to a higher standard so to just look at somebody with lust is committing adultery within uh, their heart mm-hmm. and that played a huge huge part in my husband's repentance and then when he was telling me that everything that was going on you know it was, it was basically he had cheated on me you know that's kind of what what right. it felt like and he he knew the extent of that and uh you know the hurt yeah 
I, I, you know, I've heard from so many people, and I'm so thankful to God for for the ways that He brings us to salvation. Because while this is something that the world means for evil, God uses for good. Because in heaven, we will know our spouses without any sin. We won't be married like we're married on earth, um, but we will know them, and we will know them sinlessly, and they will know us sinlessly. And I can't even imagine the fellowship that I'm going to have with my best friend in, in heaven in a sinless way. But here on earth, oftentimes, this is the sin that leads people the most to repentance. When they're told, oh, um, God has seen and heard every thought that you've ever thought. So every time you've lusted for another individual that's not your husband or wife, that is adultery of the heart, and God's going to hold you accountable for that. That is something that really changes people's view of sin to a greater extent. So I, I know that we don't want to glory in sin, but I do glory in the fact that God uses the clarification of that sin to bring men and women to the foot of the cross in repentance. So I think that's pretty amazing, just that alone. I really wanted to touch on when your husband first started going to like support groups, you told me that they were really just like patting one another on the back and saying everything is going to be okay. What is it that that you guys have done or maybe things that you would recommend other, other people, other families, because it's a family effort to do to help avoid falling into this sin? Um, okay, so the church that we were attending, this the last church that we were attending, there's a lot of small groups or connection groups that they, they have. And they even had some classes on Wednesday nights. And one of the classes for the men that they had it was um, Every Man's Battle. They had that curriculum, but uh, my husband, he was just kind of telling me that it didn't seem like it was very helpful because a lot of times guys would just kind of talk and if anything were to be brought up, it was more like, um, well, it's okay. We all fall from time to time. We all stumble. You know, you just have to ask for forgiveness and, and try again. You know, just keep trying and eventually eventually we'll, uh, we're, we're going to overcome this. And, you know, it's a struggle for everyone. And so there wasn't really any kind of, I guess you would say, quote unquote, battle plan put right. in place or talked about or um, like really crucifying this sin. And there wasn't any emphasis on the seriousness of the sexual sin. And then when he would try to open up about it to a couple of people, he said that they made him feel worse, um, more, yeah. like even more ashamed, because he was already, he already felt bad um, right. in the first place. He already felt ashamed, he already felt that guilt. And so they would either make him feel worse or they would just say, well, it's okay. We all stumble and fall from time to time. Right. Um, it'll get better. It'll get easier. But instead of going to scripture, like in Matthew 5, 29, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin and gouge yeah. it out and throw it away, better to lose a part of your body than your whole body to be thrown in hell. Right. Um, and so, you know, now obviously we're not going to sit here and, cut each other's eyes out or, you know, <laughs> no. chop each other's hands off. But yeah, it's expression. Do, yeah, it's not literal. Yeah. <laughs> but what we can do is take extreme radical measures right. for a problem as serious as this. You know, if you need to cancel your cable, cancel it. If you need to cancel your internet, cancel it. We put... We found the best um, web filter that would work for us, and we use Ever Accountable, so we have that on our computer, our smartphones, laptops, anything that is a uh, technology. Yeah. Right. You know, we want to make sure there's a filter on there. And for the longest time, we didn't have cable. We didn't have a smartphone for the longest time, and it seemed like. Once we did start getting, you know, we once we got the cable and internet and the smartphone, it kind of seemed like this was more often that that he would fall into this pattern. So now we want to put up 
barriers and boundaries. And I have access to his phone at all times. I have access to his email. I have access to all his passwords. So there's nothing that, and you know, and if a husband or wife isn't willing to do that, then you know, there's, that should be a red flag. Yes, Um, definitely. Big red flag. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, he has me listed as um, his accountability partner on ours. You can, on the Ever Accountable, you can have as many accountability partners as possible. That's great though. (laughs) They have these apps, they have these filters available, that there is help, that there are boundaries. Obviously, brothers and sisters in Christ that have either struggled with this or just want to help other people that are struggling with this, they've gone through a lot of effort to make this stuff available. Most of the time it's completely free because there's a love for one another in the church that we should have, which is why you are doing all of these things to watch and to give him boundaries. We love our children so much that we don't let them run next to cliffs right? because it's dangerous. We don't let them play next to busy highways. It's dangerous. They have boundaries. We don't give them knives to play with when they're little. But for some reason, we think as partners, as spouses, that there's no need for that in our marriage. But there's, if we love one another, that's exactly what we're going to want to do. We're going to want to give one another these boundaries, not to be controlling, not out of spite, never to punish because God is the justifier. He's the one that is going to punish sin for anyone who has sinned. But because our spouses, for that reason, like that alone should be enough for us to say, hey, I want to protect my husband or my wife from this sin because God is a just, holy, and righteous God. So what can I do? How can I help in this way? And so that should really be our heart. I would never encourage somebody to just be controlling because they are um, angry or spiteful. Our heart needs to be that we love them enough that we want to help in any way that we can help. Because the thing is, is I mentioned gossip earlier, that there's a lot of women who struggle with gossip. Now, gossip is very hurtful to a lot of people. So I'm not going to downplay gossip, but I, what I don't want to do is downplay the addiction to pornography because you're not going to get a divorce over gossip. You're not going to have an affair because of gossip. Gossip may hurt people's feelings. It's definitely going to hurt your witness, but it's not going to destroy the lives of your family. So this is a different type of sin that we need to approach differently. Like Second Timothy 2.22 says that we need to flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness. So what a lot of times I see in churches is they will either focus on one or the other of those commands. They'll either focus on avoiding the, the youthful lust or they'll focus on pursuing righteousness. But we need to do both. So when you have a, a spouse struggling with this kind of sin, you want to help them to avoid the youthful lust. They need to be fleeing from that then you need to replace it with something. You need to give them that pursuant of righteousness in any way that you possibly can. And that might be um, encouraging them to Bible study. It might be doing a Bible study with them. It's certainly going to be praying with them. It's certainly going to be like you did, ordering the books that, you know, that will bless him. It's a replacement of that. We don't want to empty our house, you know, like we want to sweep out the bad stuff and then fill it with godly things. So I think that's really awesome advice. Set those boundaries. Don't avoid that. And I'll include links to this. If you'll if you'll send me those via text, I'll put them all in the description. So if anybody wants to use that accountability app and that filter. And also, I want to say this really quickly in and in as much with as much love as I can possibly muster. If you need to get rid of your cable and internet for your spouse, please do that instead of complaining about the fact that you won't be able to watch shows or play online. Your spouse's spiritual life is far more important. So I heard Ray Comfort once give this explanation about it. He said the reason why promiscuity and um, pornography is so offensive to God. One of the reasons why it's sinful is because he set up sex to be a blessing to marriages. It's He gave us this blessing. It came from God. He created this as a way for us to love one another. But it's sort of like if you have this crisp, new, clean $20 bill, and for inflation's sake, we're going to say $100 bill, and you plan on giving this beautiful new $100 bill to your child. You tell your kid, tomorrow, I'm going to give you this $100 bill. And instead of waiting for you to give it to them, they sneak in your room and they steal it. So you had this great gift to give them, but instead of waiting for it, they stole it. They took it for themselves. So they took this beautiful gift and they made it sinful. 
And that's what happens whenever human beings in general are promiscuous or they watch and see things that they shouldn't be watching and seeing. We're taking something that God literally gave as a gift and we are stealing it and perverting it. So that that's what makes it exceedingly sinful. It's not just the act of doing it, but it's the fact that we are going against the actual plan that God has put in place, the natural means which which God has given us for this act. Yeah. Um, I wanted to backtrack uh, real quick, too, about the um, backtrack accountability. Account. As a wife, if you are going to be his accountability partner, first, I just want to say that it won't be easy. And if you're not prepared to face something that is going to hurt you again, and again and again you know you might want to consider just having another uh, accountability partner or you know more than just yourself so i did want to point that out because you know i was like at first i was yeah sure of course i want to be your accountability partner and i want to help you and you know we can do this together and then <laughs> and then i just kind of felt like i don't know if i can do this i don't know yeah. if I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I could can be here for him without breaking down because it's awfully hard to yeah. stay strong for uh, your spouse. Um, yeah, you know, as a woman, because we're very emotional, yeah. sensitive creatures, and it's important. already hurting you. Like you're, you're you're already hurting from this. The sin is already affecting you. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, so you know, just keep that in mind. But I, I mean. Me, myself, I think the wife would be a good accountability partner um, as long as you're not going to, as long as you are going to show grace and mercy and love and you're not going to hold anything against him. So I think we've pretty much covered it all. Is there any other advice that you would give to a wife? who's struggling this we really we really can't um as just wives we don't really know specific ways that will literally bless um a husband that's struggling in this but i think maybe just prayer for our husband obviously would be the most essential thing but as wives we can really only um we can only address our side of it <laughs> but so what else is there any other advice that you would give to wives who are struggling with this um well, the prayer, constant prayer, and it is definitely a, a must to pray for, pray for your husband, you know, um, protection, and for God to just take this, make something new out of the ashes. Another thing would be uh, to not be fearful. Do not let fear grip your heart or your mind or control control your mind there for a little while i was afraid to leave him by himself you know i didn't want him home by himself which we kind of did for a little bit like baby steps at first he wasn't allowed to be home by himself i started taking remotes with me if yeah. he had to be home by himself for some reason I would take the remotes with me so that he could not get on TV. We don't have cable, but we have like the Roku. Um, right. So yeah. he could get on Hulu or uh, YouTube. Um, yeah. On that, you know, on the TV. Because unfortunately, we can't, well, we haven't figured out how to put like some kind of filter on the TV. Right. Or, like it would be awesome if they had a, like an ever accountable app that you could put on your TV if yeah. you have a smart TV and to where it'll pick up anything that might be suspicious. But anyway. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So eventually I had to, so I had this little slogan, faith over fear. Uh, that's probably kind of popular, um, but it kind of came to me. I had to have faith um, that God and his sovereignty was going to take care of this situation. And just the Holy Spirit was going to speak to my husband's heart as well and hold him accountable for his decision to put this to death and you know truly be repentant um but you know the enemy wants to um keep keep us in fear or suspicion um of what our husbands are doing right uh, so 
eventually I got to the place where I wasn't fearful anymore. I wasn't suspicious or paranoid, um, you know, like I was at first. And because I was just, all trust was just broken between us two, or, yeah. um, you know, with him. Uh, but I think it's probably been, I don't know, six months since then. So we've taken baby steps. And another piece of advice I would give is not to take it lightly, but don't take it too far to where you want to be controlling or you drive your husband away or to where he shuts down because you want to make sure that you guys are open with each other. Stay to where you're approachable if your husband needs to come and talk to you or your wife, you know, your spouse, whoever is yeah. uh Dealing with this sexual sin. Or teenage son, for sure, yeah. Yes, or your That's the gospel, too. I mean, what you're saying is such a perfect example. We're supposed to be Christ-like, and in no way does Christ ever take sin lightly. But he also, he he doesn't strike us dead the moment that we sin. And he's always approachable um, whenever we want to come to him for repentance. And so that uh, the advice that you're giving is such a beautiful description of how Christ is with us. And so obviously we want to be Christ-like. We want to keep that in mind that our spouse's sin does hurt and it and it is painful. But like you're saying, don't be so unapproachable that they I'm not I'm not trying to say that it's the woman's fault because it's not. What I'm I'm trying to say is that your advice is perfect because it balances both sides. You're not condemning your husband. We deserve to, all of us deserve to be condemned to death for our sin. That's not the approach that Christ has taken. He's died for us in our place and he's paid for our sin. And so don't take it lightly. It's not, it's not a subject that should be taken lightly. Christ died for it. How serious does God take sin? Um, while he poured out his wrath on his own son in our place. So serious does God take sin that one sin cast Adam and Eve out of the garden and into the curse that spread throughout the entire universe. God takes sin so seriously that one sinful thought, unrepentant, without putting your faith in Christ, is enough to have you spend eternity in hell because you have sinned against an eternal God. So it is serious. Sin is very serious. But there's an aspect where we have love for our spouses whenever they sin. So I think that's a really great balance of what you're saying here to do. Thank you for spending nap time, um, your baby's nap time, talking to me about this. And we're going to be in prayer, listeners, be in prayer for spouses that are going through this. And I'm going to continue to pray for you and your husband. And we love you guys so much. Well, absolutely. I'm so glad I got to talk to you about this subject. And hopefully we can have a part two or, you know, another episode addressing sexual sin and the seriousness of, of uh, pornography and how damaging it is to the family. And I am just, you know, at first it's kind of, it's painful and then after the smoke settles and, and whatnot, you can, you know, I kind of thank God. Well, I don't kind of, I actually do thank God that all of this has happened and that all of this has been brought to light because God will definitely use this to um, help and bless others. You know, he'll use mine and my husband's experience to just bring light to the seriousness of it um, in churches, in the church, you know, how sometimes the churches just uh, push it under the rug and they do not want to talk about it for some reason. Um, But it's something very, very important that needs to be discussed within churches and, and not just a little slap on the wrist or a pat on the back and Oh, everything will be all right but you know just really taking it serious yeah. and to make sure our families stay together and that was just one of the things that my husband and I we didn't want our family to be torn apart or we didn't want to become another statistic yeah. thank you for coming on this is such an important topic so I definitely whenever you get time to do a second episode let's do that let's plan for that because this is really needed and I'd love to get into some more ways that churches can um can address this in different in different ways that we can actually help one another. So let's plan for a part two whenever you get um, time for this. This is super helpful. Yeah, definitely. That would be good. Yeah. Be awesome. All right. Well, Bye. I guess uh, we'll just be praying for you. Thank you for coming on the program. God bless. Bye-bye. I'm so thankful to my friend that came on anonymously today to discuss this topic. 
I hope that this serious conversation is eye-opening and helpful to anyone who's been struggling with it. I just want to give a quick praise report that the husband that we were discussing in this episode has actually been freed from this sin for over six months now, thanks to the boundaries put in place and the prayer that has covered his life. I ask that you would continue to be in prayer and also to consider if you know loved ones struggling with this, consider these boundaries. I hope that this will continue to bless you. And as always, beloved brethren, be good Bereans and study to show yourselves approved. Bye!